Undertale is one of the best games of all time, and I don't think anybody would really disagree with that. Of course, it's not perfect, but it's definitely one that, once you play it, you'll end up yearning for more of it. This has led many in the Undertale fandom to create their own fan games as a homage to the original, but fortunately, none of the fan games ever took code directly from Undertale. At least, I hope they didn't, because number one, that would be stealing, and stealing is bad. But number two, despite being universally praised for its amazing story and fun and unique gameplay, Undertale is known in the programmer space as one of the most poorly coded games of all time. But despite this reputation, I didn't find a whole lot of videos on YouTube covering it. Which I found interesting, seeing as how decompiled versions of the game have existed for a while. I mean, hell, that's how the Underminer community was originally made. After learning about this, I was interested in the code and making a video about it, so I grabbed myself the Undertale modding tool and took a look inside of the game. So today, we're gonna go over the code and critique it a little bit. Now, before getting into the thick of it, let me make a few things clear. I am not a professional programmer. Although I am studying computer information systems, which is the applied science version of computer science, I am by no means an expert. Although most of the stuff I will be discussing is stuff that I'm pretty confident in my knowledge of. I will also take this opportunity to invite anybody else who has been in the field for a while and or has a higher degree of knowledge than me to leave their own suggestions in the comments below, be it about the suggestions that I make, comments about the code shown in the video, or something else. I'll be glad to see them. Number two, I am not making fun of Toby in this video. Although I may crack jokes here and there, I mean them in good faith. It's perfectly fine to not know how to code optimally, so long as you're willing to learn over time. The code that I made back in high school, I find horrendous now, but now I know how to do it better. And with more knowledge on how to code, and with the team helping him now, Toby has made a lot of major improvements. At the end of the day, programming is a skill, and like any skill, you need to refine it and get better at it over time. I think this quote from Twitch streamer and fellow Undertale content creator Shay best sums up how I feel. Undertale's code is a completely unoptimized mess that barely functions and is riddled with all sorts of issues. Doesn't matter how bad the code is, the game works and people adore it for a reason. Masterpiece of a game and a great example of not needing to be great at code. Number three, I'm specifically looking at the game's code using the Underminer tool made by the folks over at the Underminer community. Although this is probably the best way to view the game's code, I have been told that it's a decompiler and not the actual source code, so there might be a few things that I end up getting wrong simply because I don't have access to the original source code. However, it's very close to the original, so most of it will be fairly accurate. One final note before getting into things, this is technically a part two to a video I made previously going over the code for Yandere Simulator. Although a bit outdated, it's still one of my proudest videos to date, so if you like this video, you're gonna like that one. Just bear with me on the poor editing. Anyways, on with the video. One of the first things I noticed upon looking through the game's code is the startling lack of comments in the code. For those who don't know what comments are, they're basically little notes that you can leave in your code. They don't really do anything, nor are they checked by the compiler. However, they're really good if you're working with a team since it helps people understand what the code does. Take this for example. Here's a snippet of code that contains a for loop. Now, I can tell what it's doing. For when i equals zero and i is less than amt, add one to i. While the loop is active, have i's fade value equal to zero. Also have i's exposition equal to whatever integer is randomly selected in random. Plus view x view minus 50. This I'm assuming generates a random x coordinate on the screen. And as for i's y position, calculate it by using the random function and subtracting 20 from the room height. Now, I may be able to tell what it's doing, but I can't exactly tell why it's doing it or what effect it has in the game. I did a Google search to figure out what it is, and as it turns out, this is meant for the post-true pacifist walk-around, where you get to see all the monsters in the overworld. Specifically, it's when you talk to Lemonbread, and she speaks about how happy she is to see her sister again. Now, while I was able to discover this on my own, that doesn't mean that it'll always be easy to do, or that you'll be able to do it at all. So having a comment in the code that says what it does, and specifically where it's being used, is really helpful, especially since Toby is working with the team now. Now, I did end up learning that decompilations of any game do end up taking away the comments as part of that process. So it is possible that there are comments in the code and the tool simply takes them out. If that's the case, then great. However, again, I'm working with what I'm presented with. Now you might be thinking, well, Ostros, he does work with the team now, but back when he first made the game, he was the sole programmer. Why would he need comments if he was the only one working on it? Well, comments aren't just for team projects. They're also good at keeping track of progress or maybe even leaving to-do notes for yourself. Here's a scenario that I'm pretty sure a lot of you went through at some point. 
You're hammering away at a project, really starting to get into the groove, and you made a good chunk of progress. When you decide to take a break, maybe go out and hang with your friends or something else. Then when you come back to finish it all up, you completely forgot where you were, what you were doing, and you don't even remember what some of your work was about. That is pretty much what comments are for. Of course, it's not required, and it is possible to keep track of progress or leave notes in other ways. Or who knows, maybe Toby just has intellect on a completely different level. But in general, it is best to use them, especially when collaborating with other people. One of the biggest horror stories that I heard about Undertale's code is the fact that all of the dialogue in the game is stored within a single script file. However, I learned that that's not actually true. Well, somewhat. There are many script files in the game called Readable Room, which store a lot of dialogue that's found in the different rooms throughout the game. This can include anything from battle dialogue to just general dialogue when you interact with NPCs. However, I also came across a file which was labeled scr underscore text. And this file contained basically all of the game's dialogue, barring some of the dialogue that was in the readable rooms mentioned earlier. I'm not entirely sure if this is a byproduct of the decompilation or if this is real. I've seen many online claim that Toby admitted that this file was real, but for the life of me, I can't figure out where he said that or if he said that at all. But for the sake of this video, let's assume that it is. Now, performance-wise, this is completely fine, as the game runs just fine. However, this must have been a nightmare to debug. I don't even want to know how much time was spent making sure that all the if statements worked correctly. Here's personally how I would have done it. Have a set of five folders, each named after one in-game location. Ruins, Hotland, Waterfall, Snowden, Core, and Capital. Each one of these folders will have a bunch of different script files containing all the dialogues for each of the respective areas, probably being named after the different rooms. This way, everything is neatly organized, and should you ever need to debug something, it'll be as easy as just choosing the file that contained the dialogue. And honestly, the readable room files aren't really a bad idea either. I mean, yeah, it would be pretty annoying to have to surf through those as well, but it's still better than just having a single script file for all the dialogue, especially since Undertale is an RPG. Encounters in Undertale are pretty interesting. They're determined by a specific number rather than being random chance like most RPGs. There isn't really anything inherently wrong with this approach, and as I said, it's very unique, as it allows Toby to make something like the No Mercy route possible. Here's how it works. The amount of time to get encounters in Undertale are determined by this snippet of code. What it does is that it calculates the number of steps that you have to take in order to get your next encounter. This is determined by calculating what number is made by adding argument 0 to the number that's generated from the randomly selected double that's calculated from argument 1. And then argument 1 is rounded to a whole number, and then that number is multiplied by the population factor, which is different for each area of the game. This is a pretty cool way of determining random encounters, and it's unique from the typical percent percentages that RPGs usually have, and I don't really have much in the way of critiquing it. The only thing I can really say is that it probably would be better to have the game call an integer rather than making the computer go through the trouble of rounding from a double, but that's just me. And like I said, it doesn't really affect the game at all performance-wise. But speaking of encounters, the actual encounters themselves are determined by two files, SCR Monster Setup and SCR Battle Group. Battle Group determines the encounters, and Monster Setup stores things like their attack, defense, XP, gold, etc. And both of these are, yet again, huge case statements. Again, I can't say for certain whether or not this is because of the decompilation or if this is actually how it is in the code. But for the sake of the video, let's say that it is. Much like with my critique with the dialogue, random encounters can be determined by having separate scripts for each of the areas in the game. Although for the monster attributes, instead of having a script file with a case statement, it probably would be better to have a database instead. My personal recommendation would be something like a JSON file. That way, storing different stats for the monsters is easier and can be more easily read. I'm not really sure if GameMaker allows for JSON files, but if they do, that's definitely something to look into. I want to reiterate one more time that I'm not a pro, and there's definitely going to be some problems with my critiques as well, which is why I encourage people in the beginning to leave their own suggestions down below. Overall, however, this was a pretty fun dive into the game's code, and I hope I was able to explain it in a way that you were able to understand, even if you don't know much about coding. These types of videos take a while to make since they involve a lot of research and understanding on how code operates, but even still, they're a lot of fun to make, and I learn more as I make them as well. They're different from my usual funny clip and review videos, but they're just as cool to me. But in any event, that's gonna be it for me for now. Thanks for watching. If you liked what you saw and you wanna see more, hit the like button and subscribe. But with that, I'll see you next time. And until then, stay safe and take care.